Amen. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifest, manifold grace of God. Oh boy, this is a good one. Whether you recognize it or not, I am of the belief, and I think Paul talks a lot about it in his letters, about the fact that when you're saved, God takes and either provides you with or amplifies gifts that you have. It is good to see you tonight. We are concluding. We are landing this plane in 1 Peter. We're in chapter 4 tonight, and it's my goal to get through chapter 4 and 5 this week and next week. Uh, because on the 20th, I believe it's the 20th, um, two weeks from tonight, we will begin our uh, journey in the book of Genesis. Now, because uh, we're starting on the 20th, normally the, the last Wednesday of the month we would cancel just for a break, but I'm not canceling this month because I didn't think it would be a good idea to start Genesis and then take a break and then come back. So we're going to run right through, and then we'll see about October. And then obviously November, we got Thanksgiving, and then uh, December, we have Christmas and New Year's. So I may just run through and not take any more weeks off so that we can get as much of Genesis um, under us um, if, you, if you've ever looked at Genesis, the first 11 chapters cover thousands of years. Uh, it's a very broad look at um, creation and the flood and the Tower of Babel. Uh, and then in chapter 12, it hits the brakes. And from chapter 12 to chapter 50, it goes really slow and methodical into the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons. So uh, I'm looking forward to this um, two weeks from tonight. Two weeks from tonight. Invite your friends because it will be uh, an opportunity. And like we try to do on Wednesday nights, uh, I'm going to uh, answer any questions you may have uh, from the book of Genesis. Uh, really from anywhere, but I want to focus on Genesis, but we're looking forward to it. So let's jump in. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Um, and and then we'll be in chapter 4 as we continue this idea of submission, uh, really what he's been talking about for the last few chapters. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you to see the campus bustling with kids and uh, getting ready to start Awana, and we pray that your spirit would move in a powerful way, that these children would be affected by everything that they hear. We pray for every teacher, group leader, facilitator. We pray that your spirit would have its way uh, in this campus tonight for all the other Bible studies that may be taking place. We just pray that your spirit would move in a powerful way. Father, we lift up Miss Betty to you right now. I just heard uh, about her condition, and I just pray that as she goes through this very difficult battle, that uh, she will come out on the other side victorious. Father, we just pray that you would uh, provide her comfort, provide her your loving warmth as only you can, and let her know that she has a church who loves her and a God who comforts. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, that you allow us this opportunity to come before you. We lift up Jose to you, who's in the hospital. Uh, we just pray that he will quickly recover from his uh, infirmity, and we just pray that you would visit him right now and let him know that, that he's loved. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you give us to study your word, and we pray that you would bless us. And we ask you all these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. The conversation continues. 
I'll read through the first six verses, and then we will um, look, take a deep dive. Therefore, 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, when we walked in lusts, when we walked in drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, Uh uh-oh, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to the God in the Spirit. Now, Peter causes a lot of trouble. But we know that the the scriptures are inspired by God, so I'm not going to blame Peter, just a little bit, to again bring up a subject that is a little bit tricky. So we're going to get there. Uh, And again, I've got two weeks to get through this, and there's some good stuff coming in chapter 5. But we're going to do the best we can. He says, therefore. Now, anytime you see the words, therefore, you have to ask yourself a question. What's it there for? Because he is reminding us of the sufferings of Christ. Remember, when you study the Bible, don't don't let chapter and verse dictate to you um, that maybe a, a new topic has started. Don't don't do it. Um, because chapter and verse um, cu- came much later. These were written in letter format. So chapter and verse come later. So oftentimes when you're seeing this, you, you have to realize that he's continuing his thought, talking about Christ's sufferings and those things that that we will have to suffer through. Now, if you remember last week, we spent two weeks, two weeks talking about verses 18 through 22, and I label them as the most confusing verses in all of Scripture. Without question, and we spent a lot of time diving in and talking about those, and I'm not going to even broach the subject, only because I will get stuck. So, we're going to move forward. So, he is talking about Christ's suffering and ours. So, he says, therefore... Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Considering Christ as an example, the followers should arm themselves with the same mind. Now, is he saying have the same mind of Christ? Yes, he is. Now, obviously, Christ lived a sinless life, a perfect life, and he is the Son of God. So that is a very difficult subject to broach because we cannot be Christ. But what he is saying is, have the mind of Christ, try to to arm yourselves with the same mind of Christ, and we should expect to suffer, and the options are sin or suffering. And he paints a picture for us, and he says, okay, which one would you choose, sin or suffering? And the answer is clearly he wants us to focus on the fact that we will be better off, especially he's talking to the diaspora, he's talking to these folks, but I think it applies to Christianity today too, where we have to choose between a life of sin where the enemy will leave us alone, but our joy will get robbed and and we will not walk in the joy of the Lord, or we choose super easy uh, suffering. Now you say, well, how can that be super easy? Because you know um, 
that you're living for Christ and the joy of the Lord will remain. So the, the, the power of sin is broken when we choose to suffer. When we choose to say to God, okay, bring it on. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men. We are then controlled by the will of God. He says at the end of verse 2, but for the will of God. And many people have asked me, well, how do I find the will of God? Like it's some kind of hidden treasure. Like it's some kind of pirate treasure and you have to follow the map and find the X and maybe it'll help you. Listen, all you have to do to find the will of God is stay in his word. That's all you need to do is stay in his word and do what he tells you to do. You can't use white out on the Bible. You can't pick and choose what you want to do because it's, you know, it's what's comfortable. It's what feels right. Here, Peter is being very, very blatant with his challenge. It's either sin or suffering. And I'm recommending, Peter says, that you choose suffering. Because he says, if you choose suffering, you are in the will of God. So the power of sin is broken when we choose to suffer. Because we will be controlled by the will of God and live for the glory of God. And then in verse 3, he gets a little bit. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. And now, I want you to, to understand. When he uses this term Gentiles here, he is using it in a sort of a derogatory way. Obviously, we have Jews and we have Gentiles. And when we talk about Jews and Gentiles, there's the Jews, then there's everyone else who are the Gentiles. And most of the time, they refer that to them as people groups, Jews and Gentiles. And, and that's not a derogatory term. But here, though he's using the same word, his tone is one of being derogatory, where he's basically saying, and I'm going to translate for you in the way I think he's saying it. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime, by the way, for those who use, we're in chapter 4, 1 Peter 4, verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the world. We have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the world of sinful men we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing what the flesh told us to do so he is saying there's got to be a break there's got to be that's why that's why it's important we understand that there has to be repentance when 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 we talk about salvation many people say oh you know come to jesus you know give it all and they don't talk about repentance and I think we're missing the mark because it's important that, yes, we come to the altar. Yes, we pray for Jesus. Yes, we ask him to come into our lives. But then we get up and live the same way. It's just not, it's not practical. What's practical and what Peter is saying is you've got to, there's got to be a shift. There's got to be a change. Repentance means a change of mind. You were, repentance literally means you're going in one direction and when you give your life to Jesus, you have to go 180 degrees in the other direction, have a change of mind, a change of attitude, a change of lifestyle. Everything has to change. He said, you cannot live like the world lives. We have spent enough time doing that. When we walked in lewdness, I'm going to quickly give you the, the, the bullet points here. He says, lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Lewdness is unrestrained indulgence, primarily in the world of sexual immorality. Lust is gratification of unlawful appetites of any kind, but probably also 
referring to sexual sins. Drunkenness, giving oneself over to the control of intoxicating beverages with the resulting weakening of the willpower to resist temptation. There is a close link between drunkenness and immorality. Right. When, when people, you've heard the term liquid boldness, when, when it is my belief that most illicit affairs often begin with some flirtation in the office or whatever, but they are, the threshold is crossed when liquid boldness is involved. Let's go out and have a couple of drinks. Let's go out and have a, you know, and, and listen, there, there's a lot in, we talk about alcohol, people get really offended. Baptists get really, don't take away my wine, don't take away my wine. But the Bible talks a lot about drunkenness being a problem. And here is one of those examples. So listen, I didn't bring this topic. It's in the scripture. We happen to go verse by verse, and it's there. And he's talking about drunkenness, giving oneself over to the control of intoxicating beverages. So one of the things that I have realized in my life is I'll never get, I can say I'll never get drunk because I don't drink. You understand what I'm saying? I'll never get bit by a shark. Why? Because I don't go in the ocean. <laughs> I can say never. People say, well, never say never. Let me tell you something. Unless I'm on a cruise ship and that thing sinks, then all bets are off. But if I can control it, I'll never get bit by a shark. Never. Not even, listen, I don't even put my feet in the water. I don't like it. No, 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 no. <laughs> And I say the same thing about a bottle of alcohol. How can you guarantee that you won't get drunk? Well, I'll just have one glass. Well, I had a really rough day today, so maybe two today. Next thing you know, you have a bottle. And next thing you know, you open the second bottle. And all of a sudden, your thoughts are not what, what I would call in the will of God. You're allowing the control of intoxicating beverages to take over and it results in weakening of your will to resist. Other words, a lot of trouble in those bottles. It's like I tell people about smoking cigarettes. Listen, if the Surgeon General says on the box of cigarettes, these things are harmful for your health, why are you even, why, why, oh. Anyway, I got two weeks, I got two weeks. Revelries. Riotous parties and late night merrymaking. Late night. New King James says lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries. <coughs> then it says drinking parties. People go and they hang out and they play games. Ooh, that's so good. Let's play games. And they play those little cup games, you know, the little ping pong ball. And every time it lands into the cup, you got to drink. And everything's having, buddy's having fun. And let's do darts. And the loser buys drinks for everybody. That's, that's, what, that's what the world wants us to think to lower our resistance. It's all here. It's all here. Why even mess with it? Drinking parties, drinking bouts, think things which will lead to debauchery, and then what's worse is you see these drunken people fighting. If you've ever been witness to it, it's, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Um, then he says, I bo uh, abominable idolatries. The worship of idols, all the immorality that is associated with such worship. And we have to be careful when we talk about idolatry because <coughs> trying to word this so that I don't offend anybody mm -hmm. but the truth is anything can become an idol. Right. Absolutely 
anything. There are a lot of good things that we do. There are people who love to play golf. Not me, but there are people who love to play golf. And they would put golf in front of everything. Well, if you start living that way where golf, you can't, you can't miss it. No, no, can't miss that Get round of golf. Got to have that round of golf. It, it becomes an idol. Yes. Um, your children, your grandchildren can become idols. Now, obviously, we're called to love them and steward them and, and, and lavish love on them and gifts to them and, and take care of them. But once they get away and they're more important to us than our relationship with a holy God, they become an idol. And oftentimes the enemy wants to use good things in our lives to distract us from better things in our lives. Did you hear that? That was good. I should say that again. God wants to use, uh, the enemy wants to use good things in our lives to avoid us getting better things in our lives. Because whether you recognize it or not, God has the best for us. God has his best intentions for us. God wants the best for us. And when things distract us, they become abominable idolatries. The worship of idols. It could be anything. It could be your money. It could be your bank account. It could be your home. It could be your car. And, oh, you got to keep that car clean. And, uh, and you know, oh, bird pooped. Oh, i got to keep it. No, no, that's not good. i got to keep it clean. And all of a sudden, we become consumed with, with that. And how do we know we're consumed? Because we get really upset because of bird poop. Well, birds poop. <laughs> and often, you know, it... Or, you know, here's, here's what you know. You wash your car, right? You wash your car. And every time you wash your car, it rains. Why does it have to rain? That's a little bit over the top. A little bit over the top. And you could see how it would become an idol. And anything can become an idol. And here's the truth. People become like what they worship. People become like what they worship. And that's what Peter is is telling you to avoid. I'm going to read this verse again because it has a lot of information. He says, verse 3, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. We walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. So what happens is, and this is especially true when you're you're doing these things, right? You, you party, you like to go out, you like to go to clubs. You know, I talk about these things, but I got to be honest with you, it's never been my lifestyle. I've been, I was raised in church. So I, you know, I didn't have a, a, a Paul on the road to Damascus moment. I got saved at a youth camp, called to ministry two years later. My life was, I didn't fall from, you know, drug addiction or from prison or from, and my life's been a struggle for different reasons, but I don't have that kind of testimony. So, but I know many people who, who had that kind of life. I grew up in New York City, so you could imagine, you know, you know a lot of people. And then what happens is they get saved. And all of a sudden, the people that they were hanging out with, they were going to parties with, that they were doing drugs with, that they were doing all these illicit things with, now are calling them names and saying, oh, who's your holy roller? You're, oh, you're so sanctified. You're like a saint. You're like Mother Teresa. Who, who, who do you think you are? And the clean moral life of a believer condemns them. Because they see themselves now in a mirror when they look at you. And they go, well, who, who, you know, what do you think? You know, and you're not doing anything. You're not saying anything. You're not judging them. You're just not spending time with them. And, and the truth is, you know, oftentimes they will pull you down a lot easier than you will pull them up. It takes a lot more effort for you to pull them up. Just, just to, to explain it, you know, with gravity. It's harder for you to pull them up than it is for them to pull you down. And they're in quicksand and they want to pull you down. And the clean moral life 
will call them to this idea of condemnation and they will then begin to turn it on you. And, and verse 5 says, verse 5 says, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Wow. So, if you remember verses 18 through 22, I, I explained to you that Peter was giving us a dichotomy of present and past mingling them together. He was talking about a situation in the past that had to do with Noah, but he's talking to this group and telling them, keep your chin up, because in the days of Noah, when the Spirit preached to the dead, you remember that he went down, all of that, he, he's reminding them that these two worlds have collided. And I humbly believe, not humbly believe, I believe without question that that is the same case here. Why? Because it is impossible to preach to the dead. We talked about this. This idea of purgatory that comes from 18 through 22 is non-existent. It doesn't exist. There is no... Listen, if you die without Christ and breathe your last breath, you're going to go night-night to a place called Hades waiting for the judgment. You, that's where you go. You go to this state of waiting. There's a lot of arguments about it being a, a place of punishment. I, I, I call it slumber. I call it perpetual waiting until after the millennial reign. We're there on Sunday mornings. We're, we're wrapping up Revelation, and it's getting really good. But you see the millennial reign, and as soon as that continues, we'll study about the great white throne judgment where all those who have lived who are going to be pulled out of Hades and pulled out of the earth are going to stand before Christ in the great white throne judgment and be judged for what they did with their lives. They will give an account, verse 5 says, to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And they're going to stand before the throne of Christ. And Christ is going to be the judge. And they're going to stand there and... The way, there's two books that are going to be opened. Two books. Now, I know I'm jumping into Revelation, but I think it's important because it says they will give an account. So two books will be opened. The first will be called the Book of Life. And the Book of Life has the names of all those who have given their lives to Jesus Christ and have been saved and are now in the audience here in, in, in this Great white throne judgment. They, they have filled the auditorium with, we, we will fill the auditorium, we'll be bystanders watching the judgment. And they'll look in this book and they say, your name is Luke Smith. Luke, 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 no, no, Smith maybe, Smith. There's a lot of Smiths. Hold on. A lot of Smiths. I don't see Luke. Maybe you have a middle name. No. And, and their names will not be in the book of life. Then there'll be another book. That'll be opened. And it'll be an accounting. And it, it'll have their name there. And their actions will be clearly delineated there. All the bad things they've ever done. See, our accepting of Jesus put our name in the Lamb's book of life and erased all the bad things. See, see what happened when we got saved? Our name was written in the Lamb's book of life. And the book of accountability all gets erased. All the things that we've done in our life gets erased. Never to be added again. Our sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. So, so here he says they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, the dead here, they're dead now, but when they were alive, they chose not to give their lives to the Lord. You understand that, right? Because there's no judging or holding accountable the dead. They've already died. 
But what he's saying is, when they were alive, they chose not to accept Jesus. So one day they'll stand before the great white throne judgment and be held accountable and cast into a devil's hell. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. Whoa, wait a second. So I just said you can't preach to the dead. So what is he talking about? Again, they are dead now, but when they were alive, they all had an opportunity to accept Jesus. I believe the reason Jesus hasn't returned yet is because there are people who haven't heard about him. He said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Now, I'm going to tell you, I believe that that place is ready. It's been shined up. It's been dusted. The windows have been cleaned. Our heavenly abode is ready. But the world still needs to hear about Jesus. There are places where there are no Bibles. There are places where the language barrier is beyond. And they haven't heard about Jesus. And I believe in the sovereignty of God that when that takes place, the rapture will then come. So he says here, for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. Not dead now, because when they were alive, I mean, they are dead now, but when they were alive, the gospel was preached to them. Somehow, some way. Now, there is a, a theology that I, I can kind of understand, and it's uh, what's called a nature or natural theology. And God has a way. Don't understand it, because I live in America. I live in a place where you've got 17 religious channels and a lot of opportunities to hear the gospel. But there are places where nature draws them in. And they see nature, and they realize that this is not man-made, that there has to be a God, and in the process of them recognizing that there's a God, the Holy Spirit works in them, and I believe it is possible for them to get saved. Jesus is the only way, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, somehow, through this natural theology, they can understand that there is a higher power and they, they want to hear about him and they want to learn about him, and they do. How does it all work? I'll find out when I get to heaven, I promise you. <laughs> For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And he is saying there, he is saying there, um, in a series of admonitions, and I, I'm going to switch the subject here because this is where we're going to end this, these last two chapters. He's going to talk about service and he's going to talk about suffering. And it really begins in verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be serious and and watchful in your prayer. So he's going to give us a, a series of admonitions because he's reminding us that the end is at hand. So he says, be serious and watchful in prayers. When we pray, we should be free from distraction and free from stress. Now hear me. If your quiet time is often robbed because you got a problem, or the phone rings, or you fall asleep, or something preoccupies you and your quiet time is interrupted, Peter is saying, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be serious 
and watchful in your prayers. When you pray, all other distractions must be. Listen, you can take 15 minutes. You can take 30 minutes. Whatever, whatever your quiet time is, I'm not here to dictate your quiet time, but whatever it is, it's got to be serious and distraction-free and definitely stress-free. If you start to pray, and I've often been guilty of this, so I, I'm not pointing fingers. You start to pray, and all of a sudden your mind wanders thinking about problems or people or situations. And you lose focus? If you did that at work, you'd be fired. And God's going, okay, you started something. Come on. I'm waiting for you to tell me you need me. So he says to them, listen, be serious and watchful in prayers. If you are someone who likes to write notes, and I know many of you do, this is some good admonitions. You want to you wanna really be in the will of God? Be serious and watchful in your prayers. I don't know how to find the will of God for my life. It's right there. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Verse 8. And above all things. Ouch. So he says, listen, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And then he says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. Why? Because love will cover a multitude of sins. Fervent love fervent love fervent love doesn't publicize faults fervent love doesn't point out somebody else's weakness fervent love covers someone makes a mistake you go and you love on them and you and you help them through and you walk with them revelation uh, Proverbs 10:12, my mind's in Revelation. Proverbs 10:12 reminds us that love covers. It's not about doctrine. It's about fervent love. True love is able to overlook minor faults and failures in other believers. If this was a marriage class, I'd spend three weeks talking about this. Because you know, when you're in a marriage and you're really having a hard time and you know your wife is one who likes to leave the toothpaste tube open and you get that goopy part on the end and it's kind of gross and it bothers you, but most of the time you're fine with it. You just work around it. Little, no problem, but okay, go. But then you come in one day and you had a bad day. And all of a sudden, you see that on the counter. You're getting ready to brush your teeth, and you see the goopy white or blue toothpaste or green, whatever you use, and it's there, and it's goopy, and it's dry, and it's, oh, and you take the toothpaste, and you get so aggravated, you just throw it across the room. <laughs> Peter is saying love covers a multitude of sins. Does that really outweigh the love I have for my wife or her love for me? No. So you, you overlook certain things. You're willing to put them under the blood. You're willing to... True love is able to overlook minor faults and failures. And true love is also able to confront major faults and major failures. You know, sometimes we try to sweep things under the rug and all you do is get a mountain. You get a blockade. You get something that's now in your way and it can cause some stumbling. So minor faults and failures can be overlooked, but major faults and failures, if you cover it with love, you just deal with it. And you learn from each other. And you, you, you recognize this admonition. You have to have fervent love 
because he says, above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Uh oh. One clear way for us to show that we love each other is by practicing hospitality. Hospitality is a tremendous privilege. The Bible teaches us quite a bit about hospitality. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 reminds us that sometimes we unwittingly, un <coughs> unknowingly entertain angels. Matthew 25 40, <coughs> kindness showed to the Lord himself. Matthew 20, 10 42, says your kindness will be rewarded. Matthew 10, 41 said the prophets were rewarded. Luke 14, 12 says you entertain those who cannot repay you. And by the way, when you pro practice hospitality, you, you are doing it not to expect something back. Hard to believe we're just a couple of months away from the greatest season of the year. I love Christmas. I'm, I'm a Christmas nerd. I love Christmas. And I remember as a kid how much I loved receiving. It was just, I loved it. And the bigger the box, the greater the blessing. And I don't remember when, but it probably had to do with me having children that now Christmas for me is the blessing of giving. And it's a greater blessing. And I know you all heard this. This is not new. And everybody here is either a parent or been a parent or you have nephews and nieces. And you just, there's something about that idea of giving. Publix tugs at your heart, you know, with those commercials yeah. they have yeah. now. Have you seen the new one with the, with the bride yeah. who, who says, Dad? All her life, she called him Chris. All her life, she, he was Chris. He was the stepdad. He raised her. He helped her to learn, you know, whatever it was she was learning and helped her to cook and helped her to... And he was a good bonus dad. And he was a good person in her life and gave her everything that she needed to, to become the woman that she becomes. And then on her wedding day, um, I don't know why I'm promoting a public... I just love it. <laughs> but on her wedding day... He walks in and he's overwhelmed by how beautiful she looks. And he goes, wow, you look beautiful. And she goes, thanks, Dad. And it, it appears that that's the first time she says, Dad. And he just, you can see his face. He's overwhelmed and they hug each other. And I cry every time I see that commercial. <laughs> but, you know, Publix don't mess with you that way because it's about this idea. They, they recognize that Christmas is not about even giving and receiving. It's about being together about sharing your time and sharing your love for one another. I don't know if they read this chapter from Peter, but somebody at Publix, by the way, Publix is a Christian company, just so you know. Uh, I know the family that started it, and I know their mindset. They're not as stringent as the guy who started Chick-fil-A where they closed on Sundays, but it's a very Christian, and people who work at Publix will tell you they're very, very good about the way they, they run things. Shop at Publix. <laughs> That's my commercial, just in case you're watching. Where were we? Verse 10. Be, be, verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Oh, I didn't talk about that. No. I forgot about the grumbling part. Because, listen, a lot of us will be hospitable, but we're like... And then we use that, that great southern term that I love when I moved here. I hadn't heard that term. And I learned it. I learned I learned how to be a southerner real quickly. Bless their heart. <laughs> bless their heart. That's that's like that bless their heart covers a multitude. You could you could talk bad about 
you know, Miss Susie, and you say all these things, and then you, you cover it with a bless her heart, and you think that covers everything. No, it doesn't. And you can try to be hospitable, but you have to do it from a perspective of doing it without grumbling. This is good stuff. I'm enjoying it. As each, verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifest, manifold grace of God. Oh boy, this is a good one. Whether you recognize it or not, I am of the belief, and I think Paul talks a lot about it in his letters, about the fact that when you're saved, God takes and either provides you with or amplifies gifts that you have. And there are many, many different gifts. Uh, And one of the gifts that is often talked about is this idea of hospitality. And here he's talking about hospitality and he's reminding the reader that as each one has received the gift. So he is stating something that I believe, that every believer has a gift. Now I'm not talking about love languages here. That's so annoying. What's my love language? My love language is touching. My love language is, you know. Oh, stop that. Stop. <laughs> love language is that we should love each other fervently and cover a multitude of sins. Forget about, you know. Oh, anyway. Yeah, she agrees with me. Good. I appreciate that. I needed some amens. <laughs> As each one has received a gift. So he's saying that each one of us have have received a gift. And as we have received the gift, minister to one another. And that word minister is simply serve. You know, there's a lot of pastors who don't agree with this, but uh, being a pastor is being a minister, and being a minister is being a servant. And, 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 And that's why Jesus said, listen, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Our our goal is to serve one another. Not to drive a fancy Mercedes Benz and, you know, have all this security around you and and, and just be able to walk out without greeting the people. You, You just can't operate that way. He says, as each one has received a gift, minister to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So, Gifts are a stewardship of God so that God can be glorified. And by the way, don't take credit for it. Oh, that's so nice what you did. Oh, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, it cost me, you know, $40, but it's it's okay. I, I hope you're... No. No, you do it. That's why the Bible says your left hand should know what your right hand's doing. You do it, and when they say to you, you know, why'd you do that? He says, I just felt led or it's for God's glory. God needs to, you know, I just, God told me to do it. And and that's a, that's a, that's an example where it's okay where you could say God told you to do it. Be careful how to use that. Don't walk out of here and say, Bob said I can say God told me to do something. No, no, (laughs) no, that's not what I mean. But I'm saying if you're going to do something good in love and use your gifts and use your talents and use what God has blessed you with to give it to somebody else. You say, listen, it all belongs to God. So we must not be terminals of God's grace. We must be channels of God's grace. I wrote some good stuff down here, people. <laughs> I write these notes like months ago. And, and then when I read them, I get excited. Because that's some good stuff. We're not to be terminals of God's grace. You know, where everybody wants to be blessed by God. God, bless me, bless me, bless me. And then all of a sudden we become saturated with God's blessing. And we forget that God is blessing us so that we could be a blessing. 
and I use the kitchen sponge as my example of this. If you keep a kitchen sponge wet and saturated, it doesn't take long for that kitchen sponge to smell really, 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 really bad. <laughs> and you think, well, it's clean water and it's soap and I don't understand why, you know. No, a sponge is supposed to be wrung out as a Christian should be wrung out. So if God is blessing, it's not for you to be fat and happy and get up in church and sing, I shall not be moved. It's for you to be a blessing. We are to be a channel of blessing. If God is blessing you, you should try to figure out how I can bless somebody else. And this word manifold really means multicolored, variegated, magnificently varied. So when you think about this verse, verse 10, and it says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the multicolored, variegated, magnificently varied grace of God. Which means grace comes in many different facets, in many different ways, and God will bless. You know that term grace is one that's dear to my heart for many different reasons. It's the unmerited favor of God. And oftentimes God uses us as a channel of his grace where God is bringing favor upon somebody and there is nothing better, nothing better than to you to be a part of that. Not because somebody's going to recognize you, not because somebody's going to give you praise, not because somebody's going to thank you, but because you know you're doing what God has asked you to do. And it is the manifold, I love that word, grace of God. multi colored it comes in many different varieties his grace comes from different areas many of you know this but we were looking for a name for our child when Carla was pregnant and we were sitting across from our dear friend the pastor who was pastoring at Aloma at the time he now pastors at First Baptist Atlanta and we were sitting at a Chili's having dinner one Sunday night and you know he starts joking around about different crazy names and then he stopped and he looked at my wife and my he said how about Karis like what my, my wife's like what no Karis it means the favor of God it means grace and my wife just started to cry. She didn't even know she she was going the next day. That's where the conversation goes to find out what the gender was, which is a different story because my daughter wasn't cooperating. But anyway, <laughs> um, now she's going to turn 20 and she still doesn't cooperate. <laughs> I won't let her watch this. But my wife started to cry, and then the next day she cried even more when she found out she was having a girl. So my daughter's name is Karis Hope. Caravaggio, which is grace and hope. Um, but they've called her carrots and peas and carrots and <laughs> all kinds of names, but we love her name, and that's why. So when we talk about God's grace, that's what it reminds me of. Verse 11. I'm doing good, guys. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you're called to preach, preach the Bible. I don't want to hear stories and fables and novelties and this is what happened to me it's okay to work some of that stuff in to get people's interest but you got to preach the bible 
You can't, listen, as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to stand up and preach and not read from the Bible, you might as well just shut your mouth. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. It's got to come from Scripture. It, it, it's, it's, listen, I'm not making this stuff up. It's right here. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. What's, what's the oracles of God? His word. You are a spokesman for God. There's some TV preachers that they'll stand up and they'll tell stories the whole time. The whole time. They'll tell stories the whole time. Then they'll get up, oh, let's stand up, let's stand up. If God has blessed you, give to my ministry. <laughs> you know, that's that's why I think they white out some of this stuff, or they just ignore it. Because I don't know that you could be any clearer. If anyone speaks, let them speak as the oracles of God. He is a spokesman for God. I hear some people get behind the pulpit and say the stupidest things. And I wonder if that's what God really wanted him to say. Because I'm old school. I believe if you're going to stand on that sacred ground, you have to let God lead you. And be prepared. Because if you're not prepared, people will realize it right away. I'm one who will realize it right away. I'm a big critic of preachers, by the way, if you haven't noticed. (laughs) Big critic. If anyone speaks, let them speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, okay, here we go, serves. If anyone serves, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified. Humble recognition That it is God who empowers us to serve. No pride. God should get all the credit. Why'd you do it? Well, you know, I just, I and I, and I felt that I, Mm -hmm. and that, you know, it was something that I should do. Stop it. Because there's going to come a time where you think you're blessing, right? So, we talked about this already, but I want to go back to it because you you are blessed to be a blessing, right? You're with me, right? Mm-hmm. You're blessed to be a channel of blessing. So God continues to pour down blessings from heaven so that you can be a blessing to someone else. And when you start being a blessing to someone else and taking all the credit, God's well of blessing will dry up. And you're wondering, what's going on? Why am I having so many problems? Why, 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 why did this happen? And why did that happen? And why? Well, you know, hey, dummy, you stop doing what I asked you to do. And you're no longer a channel of blessing. You're just a terminal. And when the terminal dries up, you start asking God why. Why'd you leave me? Why are you so far away? Let me tell you something. God is not far away. God has not moved. He does not move. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he seems far away to you, it's because you've moved. That'll preach. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. And in all things... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God's who empowers us should get all the credit. No pride. No ego. And we'll finish this next week, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 4. And concluding in chapter 5. Remember chapter 5. Chapter 5 has a lot of good stuff. Chapter 5 is where he says, The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's some good stuff.
Don't miss it next week. And then two weeks from today, we'll start Genesis. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity which we see from your word tonight. We thank you because Peter was who he was. And yeah, some of his words caused some confusion and some of his ideas seemed a little bit strange. But when it came to telling people what it was like, he was clear cut as he could be. And we thank you for that. He didn't try to gloss it over. He didn't try to make it with fancy words. He told us straight. And we appreciate what we've heard tonight and how important it is for us to live the way he has asked us to live. We want to know what the will of God, what your will for us is. Just read. Read scripture. Read First Peter. Father, we thank you. We pray now as we leave this place that you would be with us, get us home safely, and return us on Sunday to worship with you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray all these things. And God's children said, Amen. Amen.